Now, the average member of the Wisconsin Bicycle Federation is a 52-year-old white guy, uh, makes over $75,000 a year, and rides one of these, a road bike. These are my people. <laughs> these guys have been underrepresented in our society. <laughs> and I'm here uh, for them, for their cause, for my brothers. Um, but that's another talk. Let's, uh, let's talk about something else. So uh, what I want to talk about is the bicycle as a vehicle for social change. This is a picture I took in Munster, Germany. I went over to uh, Europe. It was hard duty uh, when I was mayor uh, to explore uh, bicycle infrastructure in Europe. And we went to horrible places like Amsterdam and Utrecht and <laughs> other places like that. But it's uh, part of the sacrifice of public service. And uh, this is a picture I, uh, I took uh, in Munster. And Münster, Germany uh, is one of the leading bicycle cities in Europe. This is sort of a bicycle belt line. Goes around the city. Um, and people use it for commuting, every day for commuting. And I think it's a pretty good indication of the diversity of folks. These aren't people in Lycra. Uh, they don't wear helmets in Europe. Sorry, but they don't. Uh, they're just people on their bikes. They got on their bikes to get to where they needed to go. And they didn't really think about it. And there's so many cyclists in Munster that they kind of flow like fish, like schools of fish. Um, and we were there, I was there with about 20 other people from Madison, and we rented the bikes. Now, when you rent bikes in Munster, all the bicycle rental companies have yellow bikes. And you get into the schools of fish, uh, bicyclists, and what, they don't really use their brakes uh, in Munster, uh, but we, we did. And uh, we were overhearing uh, some folks, uh, some of our group understood German, and we were referred to as the yellow danger. Uh, <laughs> and so we still have uh, get-togethers uh, you know, where we talk about uh, that trip in cycling. We call our group the yellow danger. So this is what cycling looked like when it began. You see this picture uh, from the 1890s. There, the cycling craze, which really hit the United States in the 1880s and 1890s, was really about these guys, for starters. Um, and if you look, maybe you can just tell the bicycles on either end, right? They're those high wheel bicycles. And the way you got on those things was you ran alongside it, and then there was a little step, and you hopped on the step, and then you jumped on the bicycle once it had enough momentum. And then it was a fixed wheel, so it kept going. You had to catch up with the bicycle and you got going. It was not the safest activity in the world. And these bicycles were quite expensive. So if you notice this picture, right, it's more middle-aged or younger white guys, and mostly affluent white guys. That's where cycling got its start, simply because of the technology. The technology, the high-wheel bicycle, meant that it was expensive, and you had to be athletic to be able to, uh, to ride it. But then came along the safety bicycle, the bicycle we See today, the bicycle that we just take for granted was called the safety bicycle in the 1890s. And that's because, frankly, it was safe. Anybody could ride it, including women, which was a big deal. This is Susan B. Anthony, and she says that nothing had done more up to that period to emancipate women than the bicycle. And that's because they had freedom of mobility, freedom of transportation. And it, it, it threatened to upset the entire social order. If you look at that slide, on the left, this is a woman, now she's in bicycling gear, she's ready to bike, um, but she's going to abandon her family, uh, her, uh, her husband and her two children. And you can see the bicycle in the background there, kind of peeking out ominously behind the curtain, <laughs> uh, threatening to destroy the American family. Um, which of course we know it did. Um, but the point was that uh, cycling was a way for women to gain mobility, and mobility meant freedom, it, mean, it meant uh, more opportunities for jobs, more opportunities for social activity. Uh, this is a bicycling club at Lawrence University in the 1890s, all women. So you can see how the change in technology, going from the high-wheeled, expensive bicycle to the safety bicycle, more uh, reasonably priced and easy to ride, how that changed society. And it changed society in other ways. Uh, these, this is obviously uh, a couple of African-American uh, middle-class 
couples uh, out for what is probably uh, a Sunday ride. This is in Denver. Uh, but this was taking place all over America. Bicycle was an inexpensive means of transportation, a way to really move into the middle class. And this is a quote from the Pneumatic. The Pneumatic was a magazine dedicated to cycling in the 1890s and early 20th century. And the Pneumatic said that the bicycle broke down the barriers and prejudices of the state and exclusiveness. So what's happening today? Well, African Americans make up 11% of the American population, but only 5% of cyclists are African American. Hispanics make up 14% of our population, but only 6% of cyclists are Hispanic. This one gets a little tricky. We have a research department at the Bicycle Federation, and we've crunched all the numbers, we've looked at all the studies. We concluded that approximately 50% of Americans are female. Uh, you can double check that. Uh, I backed up by Wikipedia and other sources. Um, but only 24%, one out of four cyclists, uh, are female in the United States. And that's different from the rest of the developed world. In the Netherlands, over half of cyclists are women. And in Germany, where I took that picture, half of all cyclists are women. There again, uh, demographic studies indicate that roughly half of the population happens to be female. So we want to do something in, uh, unique in Madison. We want to get to 20% of all the trips taken in Madison. It's called mode share. 20% uh, of those trips we would like to be done by cycle in, in Madison by 2020. Currently, it's around 8%. We, were, we are never going to get to that figure until we get gender equity in cycling. There's another aspect of cycling that's pretty important, and, and it's the main point I want to make today. And that's that cycling is cheap. So once you buy the bicycle, or, and sometimes you can get one for free, cycling is almost uh, completely free. Actually, national study says it costs you $308 a year to run a bicycle. As compared to running a car, $8,220 a year to support a car. So imagine if a family could get away without having just one car, that's $8,000 in their pocket, $8,000 that could be spent on education or going to, a, or that money could go to a college fund. There's so many other things uh, that that money could be invested in uh, rather than just transportation. So the biggest expense in any household, as you know, is housing. And it's quickly followed by transportation. And the transportation costs are catching up rapidly with housing. And so it's interesting to look at not just the cost of housing, but the cost of housing plus transportation. And there's this cool organization in Chicago, it's called the Center for Neighborhood Technologies. And they do these studies for every metropolitan area in America. And so the slide on the, the left is the way most folks look at the cost of housing, the way realtors like to look at it. And there's this phrase in the real estate industry, drive till you qualify. In other words, drive as far away from the central city as you can until you can afford a house. But the problem with that is that they're just looking at the cost of the house. They're not taking into consideration the tremendous cost of commuting back and forth. And so the slide on your right takes that into account. And so what you see in the yellow areas are the less expensive areas. What you see is that what looks like a bargain out in the far-flung suburbs of Milwaukee actually is not so much of a bargain. And that the places that are really inexpensive to live, where a family can save and move up the economic ladder, are in the central city, in those very places that have the tight infrastructure, the, the, the places, the, the, the libraries, and the places that you can shop, that you can get to by a bicycle, because the infrastructure's there, because the distances aren't so great. And those are also the census tracts that are some of the poorest in the state of Wisconsin. So we do some, some things at Bike Fed to try to address this issue. This is the Ballad Bike Shop. It's a bike shop that we started at North Division High School a few years ago. 80 kids have gone through this program. They've learned to be bicycle mechanics. Now some of them have actually gone on to careers uh, as bicycle uh, mechanics. This is uh, AJ. Uh, he's doing that. The, the kid to his right, that's Kenneth. And Kenneth has an ambition now to open his own bicycle shop. And we know that uh, one of the things that these communities lack is bicycle mechanics, bicycle shops, uh, 
the ability to fix your bicycle when something goes wrong with it. And we're training kids to be able to do that. People donate bicycles to this shop. The kids learn how to fix them up. And then they're used in a program called Share and Be Aware and another program called Safe Routes to School in which we teach kids safe routing. And sometimes in these neighborhoods, we're teaching kids how to ride a bike for the first time. And they get into it, some of them get competitive, some of them become bicycle racers, but others just learn that the bike is a cool and easy way to get around town. This is another project similar to ours. Uh, this one is run by the generosity of the Trek Bicycle Corporation. It's called Dream Bikes. There's a shop here in Madison, another one in Milwaukee. Very much like the Valid Bike Shop, except they have a retail front. So they teach kids not only how to repair bikes, but also how to sell bikes, how to run a bike shop, how to be a small business person. But you might ask yourself, isn't cycling dangerous? You know, we do hear stories, unfortunately, about people who are hit on their bicycles and tragic accidents. Isn't, isn't it dangerous? Well, what you have to take into account is all of the things that bicycling does for us, for our health. Reduction in obesity, childhood obesity is a major epidemic in this country. Uh, and all the things that go with it, diabetes, heart disease, some forms of cancer. And there's a study that says if you take into account all of those benefits and you compare them to the risks of possibly being hurt on your bicycle, the benefits outrank the risks by a ratio of nine to one. So of course we need to make biking safer, but the truth is if we keep kids off of bicycles because we're concerned about their safety. What we're really doing is creating more risk for them in the long run. More risk of diabetes, more risk of heart disease, more risk of cancer. Um, and what we really need to do is to address those narrow risks that do exist for people riding bicycles. So the point is that when we make biking even safer, even more people will ride. We know this from a study in Portland. Now, Portland is part of America. I know some of you don't <laughs> believe that, but it is. Uh, very much like Madison, just uh, not as nice with people who aren't as pleasant, but otherwise Portland is <laughs> And they, do, they did this study, and they found that 7% of Portlanders were intrepid bicyclists, like those guys you saw on the first slide. 33% wouldn't get on a bike to save their lives. God love them, that's okay. But 60% were interested in cycling but concerned. And what they were concerned about was their safety. And what we know from this slide is that when we build safe bike infrastructure, more people will ride. It's just a simple slide showing the relationship of the miles of bike infrastructure that are built and the miles that are ridden. You build it, they will come. Simple as that. This is the Bike Fed office in Milwaukee. This is on 36th Street, 36th and Pierce, down in the Menominee River Valley. One of the poorest census tracts anywhere uh, in Wisconsin. And this is a bicycle path. It's the Hank Aaron State Trail. It's actually a bridge going over the Hank Aaron State Trail. But that trail is part of an economic renaissance in this low-income community. This is a, a broader view. That's our office there, right in the center. And that's a little bike center. It's not just the Bike Federation office. It's also, uh, there's also a, a small bicycle manufacturer there called Fixation. Fixation. They make these really cool uh, street bikes. And the guy who owns our building, who also has an office there, um, is a guy who named Tom Schuler, who actually rode the Tour de France. And, uh, and he runs a, a bicycle uh, company out of there. They put out uh, races like the Tour of America's Dairyland and some others. So it's a little bicycle center right in the center of this uh, uh, rather poor neighborhood. But look what it's done. Between us and between the Hank Aaron Trail, the building on the far left is a center on urban ecology, a multi-million dollar investment in that neighborhood. Uh, next to it is a vacant building that won't be vacant for long. It's going to be a school. Then there's our building, and the building to the right is also going to be redeveloped as office building. So bicycling is really at the center of the redevelopment of this neighborhood. And this was the celebration of the opening of the Hank Aaron Trail. This is a, a trail that winds down from 36th Street, which is a little higher down to, down to the trail. And as you can see, the uh, brewer racing sausages showed up for this event, which indicates <laughs> that it is an important event in Milwaukee uh, when they arrive. And I want to close with this. This woman's name is Alita Ramirez. 
uh, and she's a counselor at the 16th Street Public Health Center. Doesn't make a lot of money, but she's dedicated to her community. Grew up on the south side of Milwaukee, and she rides her bike every day. And I asked her what it meant to her family budget. And she said she figured it meant that she saved $20 a week. It's $1,000 a year. Now, for some of us, that may not sound like a lot of money, but for a low-income family, $1,000 a year is incredible. And I asked her about her favorite biking st uh, story. And, and she said one day she was biking. So she bikes for commuting, but she also loves to bike for recreation. And she loves to ride to Milwaukee's lakefront. And she said one day she rode to the lakefront, she was riding back, she got a mosquito in her eye. And it was bugging her, but you know, when you're on your bike, sometimes you don't want to get off. And then she said it just rained, it just poured. And it washed the mosquito out of her eye. <laughs> and she thought that was just great, just a fitting story of how when you persevere on a bike, you get through, and things get better. <laughs> So that's my point. That's my story. I, I love these guys. These are my people on the left. I don't want to lose them. I want them to keep riding. It's great. But I also want biking to be thought of as a vehicle for social change, something that will help people like Alita and her neighbors uh, get on at least the first run towards the American dream. Thank you so much. <laughs>